This episode of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast is brought to you by Policy Genius. The team at YFP is committed to bringing you an easy, one stop solution for your life and disability insurance needs. That's why we've partnered with Policy Genius, America's number one independent online insurance marketplace, allowing you to quickly get quotes from reputable companies rather than wasting time having to make phone calls and search multiple websites. Get started today with your insurance estimate by going to yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash insurance. I see the path now that it's opening up and all these different doors that it's opening up. And so that's really what I've been focused on now is kind of using it as a that funnel, if you will, to open up doors that I can then jump through and keep it interesting for me from a career standpoint, as well as find ways to supplement income and, and things like that. That was Mike Corvino talking about Core Consult RX, an evidence-based medicine podcast and social media platform he created and his vision for it moving forward to help his career and open some business opportunities. Mike has such an interesting story with not only his journey through pharmacy, building side hustles and professional MMA fighting career, but also the adversity he's faced along the way and what he's been able to do to persevere. So bottom line, I'm excited for you to learn about Mike and what he's all about. All right, let's start the show. You're listening to the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast, a show all about inspiring you, the pharmacy professional, on your path toward financial freedom. Hi, I'm Tim Church, your financial pharmacist team member, and welcome to another Side Hustle Edition, where we talk about ways you can create additional streams of income to reach your financial goals faster and highlight pharmacists making it happen to help you get inspired. Mike, thanks for stopping by and being part of this Side Hustle Edition. No problem, man. Thanks for having me. Well, if you've listened to any of the other Side Hustle interviews I've done, I like to start out with an icebreaker. And because you're somebody who does a lot of clinical work, I wanted to ask you this. So the zombie apocalypse is coming and you can only bring three medications with you. What are you, what are you bringing with you? Ooh, good question. Um, let's grab some, I guess, naproxen because I'm most likely going to trip and fall in the woods and run from the zombies. (laughs) Um, let's, uh, let's see what else. Um, We'll grab, uh, we'll, th- we'll throw on like maybe a couple, like a Z pack or two just to make sure in case I get some upper respiratory infection or something like that while I'm running. Um, gotta keep the lungs clear. And then, um, probably some allergy medicine so I can, uh, keep my sinuses and stuff open too. So I'll be doing a lot of running, I imagine, during the apocalypse. Okay. I like that. You gotta, you gotta be able to, um, maneuver and and be in good shape to be able to do that that's interesting i thought i thought you might go with like a pain med other another pain medication or maybe a benzo but i guess that's not always going to be uh in the best situation depending on what you're doing (laughs) you gotta stay sharp when those zombies are coming after you you know it's key (laughs) well mike talk a little bit about your career path as a pharmacist okay so i graduated pharmacy school in 2015 um, I did not do the residency track, um, which, you know, in hindsight, uh, I guess kind of worked out, but probably would have been a, the easier route, I think, if I had gone and done residency um, and gotten it out of the way and done all that training ahead of time, but um, went straight into working for Walgreens, um, got a pharmacy manager job uh, probably three, four months after graduation. And then during that time, I had spent pretty much all of my free time. Uh, going back to the Medical University of South Carolina, which is where I graduated, and you know, volunteering to help teach and uh, helping with like OSCEs and working with students, going to like topic discussions that their the real residents were having and things like that, just to kind of continue my education. And then uh, from there, managed at Walgreens for about three years, uh, and then got an opportunity to be a clinical pharmacist um, for a place called Federal Healthcare Network and um, work in their like diabetes program. It was kind of um, in the early stages at that point. And so I took that opportunity, switched roles, and transitioned over into more of a, a clinical role uh, at that point. And been doing that as my main job since for the last uh, going on two years now. And w- was that position difficult to obtain without a residency? So I would say normally, I think, uh, yes. And, and I even in my case, 
you know, it, it was difficult in the sense that I had spent so much time kind of furthering my own clinical knowledge. You know, I, I basically had zero time off from 2015 to 2018. Like I used all of my PTO from work um, to basically go and spend time in MUSC. We went on our first, my wife and I went on our first actual real vacation three years after I graduated. I spent literally every second of free time, every day off that I had doing something to kind of further my own clinical knowledge. And, and I kind of built this, you know, sort of reputation around myself as, um, you know, being more on that clinical side of things and being somebody that you could go to for some more clinical insight in the retail world. And then that kind of trickled over into some of the clinical world. And so I was able to kind of make that transition easy at the time that it was, you know, actually presenting itself, but it was a long kind of road to get there. But yeah, once it was actually time, the actual transition was pretty effortless because I had been prepping myself that whole time to, to make that jump. So what it sounds like is, is you did your own version of a residency, just not in the, in the traditional sense. <laughs> yeah. So that was kind of like our joke, going, me and some of my old professors and things, we were, we were kind of saying that my, I was doing a self-taught residency <laughs> and <laughs> that was kind of the, the way I looked at it. Uh, I just basically said, I'm, I'm going to put in as many hours as I can to pro- progressing as a pharmacist and learning everything I can possibly get my hands on. And, you know, I just, I actually saw it as that, even though it's kind of, you know, silly to say out loud, but I looked at it as almost like this is my residency and I'm going to do it this way. And so I just got laser focused for a few years and um, it all kind of came together. Wow. that That's really cool. And I, I don't know, I don't know if I know anyone who has done that. So essentially you're working at MUSC for free just to get that additional training and experience. I was like the weirdo, uh, I was like the weirdo <laughs> sitting in like the topic discussions and people were like, all the other residents are like, who is this guy? And I was kind of like <laughs> sitting in the back, like <laughs> answer some questions and then fade back into the you know, background. But no, it was, it was good times. I mean, it was, it was hard. It was a long road, but it was fun. So you said that diabetes management, one of the things that you're doing at Fetter Health, can you walk us through a, a typical day? What would that be like? So on a, a day where I'm just seeing patients, um, basically, like I'll take yesterday, for instance, I came in um, around eight or so in the morning, and I basically have patients that have been referred to me. Most of them are, have uncontrolled diabetes. Some of them have some other things going on as well, where they're just on a whole bunch of meds and their primary care doc will just say, hey, can you fix this? And uh, they get referred to me. So their appointment that day is just with me. Uh, the nurse takes them back, does their vitals and all that. Uh, if we need to run an A1C or something, we can do that ahead of time. And then I start my appointment with them, go through you know, the medications, figure out if there's something that needs to be changed or that can be optimized. Uh, we'll go through like lifestyle management, go through some diet, some exercise type stuff, um, whatever that patient needs specifically. And then if I need to order labs or change medications, um, then I kind of have the autonomy to do that, which is great. And uh, then if I need to have the patient come back and see me, which a lot of my patients, if it's the first time I'm seeing them, they're pretty you know, poorly controlled and things like that. So a lot of times I'll have them come back and follow up with me two or three times. And then once their A1C is good, their blood pressure is good, whatever I'm dealing with with that particular patient, um, then I'll turn them back over to primary care and let them take it from there. That's really cool. And it, it's interesting because the position that I have through the VA is, is very similar, almost verbatim, exactly kind of how you're describing it. So one of the things that that always comes up when I talk to other pharmacists who are in a similar type of position is what's the culture like at the facility with the physicians and, and the other clinicians that are there? So when I first got there, I was there was only one other clinical pharmacist that had ever been through there. And he was kind of like a contract pharmacist from uh, MUSC. So he was, you know, on the payroll of the actual college. He was going there as part of a grant that was doing some, you know, clean professional collaboration type of thing. And plus he's a lot of, he's actually one of my old professors, kind of one of my mentors. So he was a lot older than me. And so they kind of looked at him as, you know, a little differently. They, other than that, though, the only pharmacists they had ever interacted with were dispensing pharmacists. Um, which we have some great dispensing pharmacists there, but they just weren't used to a pharmacist being in the clinic. So when I first got there, it was kind of like, what are you doing here? Um, you know, <laughs> why are you back here with us instead of being in the pharmacy? But I, I kind of took the approach of I'm here just to, I'm here to learn. I'm here to, you know, 
do anything I can to help you guys. You know, you need me to get your coffee for you. I'm cool with that too. Um, you know, whatever it was. <laughs> and I, and I, I tried to be as humble as I possibly could. A lot of these, the clinicians that work there are much older than me, have been doing this for years and years. And so I was as humble as I possibly could going in, even though I'm, I'm very confident in my ability, but took a very humble approach and then kind of just let my work kind of speak for itself. And then over the months, uh, it's gotten to the point now where, you know, I, I basically anything I make as a recommendation, they'll jump on it. Like, I mean, a lot of times the I, I help with the psych department as well, and they'll it can bring me in a patient case with them. And if I say, hey, let's try this, this, and this, they'll say, okay, let's do it, and we'll we'll go that route. So I've built up really good rapport with the providers there now, uh, and it's just kind of taken a little bit for them to kind of get used to it and. Basically, I had to kind of prove myself a little bit, which is, is good. And um, yeah, but now it's great. I, like, I absolutely love the providers I work with. It's fantastic. They make my life super easy. Um, I have so much autonomy, more than I could ever ask for. And um, yeah, it's great. So prior to getting that position, you you did your own version. You did the Mike Corvino residency track. But did you have any board certifications or any other credentials prior to, to getting that position? So when I was at Walgreens, uh, I started doing some MTM and Walgreens was, was on board. They've gotten a lot more on board with MTM since I've left, which is great. But when I was, when I was there, at least in our state in South Carolina, um, we weren't doing a ton of it. And so I started kind of picking up some MTM on my own. And I was the pharmacy manager, so I had to run the actual pharmacy, but I wanted to kind of proof of concept the idea. And so I was doing MTM claims on my own, I'd go into my days off sometimes and work on them and basically showed how that it could be lucrative. And my district manager finally approached me and said, Hey, if we give you a day a week or two days a week where you can just work on this and we bring somebody else in to actually run the pharmacy, would I be interested? And so I jumped on that and uh, was able to end up, I finally ended up uh, overseeing the MTM for like 80 different Walgreens after like a year's time. And um, basically get, got enough like direct patient contact hours to where I was able to sit for the, um, it was called the CE exam, the Certified Diabetes Educator exam back then. Now that's uh, what, CDCES. Um, and you had to change it and add more letters, which is hard. <laughs> it lo- it looks better. It looks better now, Mike. I mean, I- it's, if you say so. <laughs> I had to memorize a whole new uh, set of letters. It was rough. But, um, <laughs> and, and then um, after that, I took the BCPS. I I didn't find out that I passed the BCF, BCPS until I actually um, got to my new job at, at Fetter. Um, but I think I was there for like a month or two and I found out that I had passed from when I took it. I was at Walgreens when I took it and then it was right during that transition. And then I got the AmCare uh, board certification a year later. But um, I think going into Fetter, the only one I knew for sure that I had was the CDE. So let's talk about board certifications for a minute. And this is this is a little bit off topic, but I think it's an interesting discussion. So, you know, I have the the same diabetes credential that that you do, and, and also the ambulatory care. And a a lot of people will argue, especially in the pharmacy realm, that having those credentials makes you much more marketable when you're looking for positions. And and arguably, there's some positions that they're required that you have some sort of credentials like that in order to be even considered. What do you think now in terms of when you think about the time it takes to prepare for the exams, the cost to take them, the ongoing cost, what is your thoughts in terms of of the return on the investment to even get to that point? I really think it just depends on what you want to do. Um, You know, I I don't think that I needed, other than the diabetes uh, certification, which looked really good for this new job because they were wanting to do diabetes, you know, program, I don't think it would have made a difference either way. I don't think any of them even knew what a BCPS or BC, Mm -hmm. you know, ACP or anything like that was. But um, I think it just depends on the job. As far as like, if it truly makes a difference as far as the person, I mean, me personally, if I was hiring somebody, I don't know that I would care all that much. I mean, because when I passed like my board certifications, it wasn't like, all of a sudden I was this miraculous pharmacist comparatively like to before. I mean, my knowledge set was just basically proving that I knew what I knew. Uh, I, I think, you know, a test is a test. I mean, you can only judge so much just because someone's a great test taker doesn't mean that they're going to be fantastic with patients. So for me, I did it just because 
it was one of those things. One, I, I was told that you know I would never become a clinical pharmacist unless I had a residency. And then I was told that I would never be able to get board certified unless I'd done a residency and all this kind of stuff. And so honestly, for me, it was more of like just a personal thing, just to prove a point and prove that I could pass it. <laughs> and it was more on that realm, more so than it was, I thought that it would make a huge difference you know, in, in my actual career. But I think I definitely think places, like you said, some places like look at that and think that's the end all be all. If you're, if you don't have that, they don't even want to look at you. So I, I really just think it depends. Um, it's, it's hard to judge whether it's a, you know, a good return on investment. I, I think it just ultimately ends up on which employer you go with and how that person particularly sees it. So does it, does it get you a pay bump if you, if you add more credentials, if you become, a, get another board certification? No, not, not at my current job. So, I mean, I think that's interesting too, because obviously it's not the incentive for most people why they're doing it, but it, it could be one of the benefits um, depending on, on where you are. There's a lot of government organizations that that's one of the ways that you can get extra steps or, or increase your pay. But I think it's interesting, and and I like that you said that 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 you were you were proving yourself in in one respect. Because honestly, when I when I looked at kind of your resume before we jumped on here, I think most people would assume they're like, okay, well, where where'd you go to residency? Where, where'd you do your residency? Did you do PGY two or or did you just do a PGY one? Yeah, and, and that's I think a lot of I, usually when I tell people I didn't do one, it's like, well, what do you mean you didn't do one? How did you get board certified? <laughs> there's there's more than one path to do it. I promise. Sure. So, Mike, you're you're doing well at Fetter Health Care Network, working as an Amcare pharmacist, working with patients, helping manage their chronic diseases. At what point do you say I want to do something more? I want to do something beyond just my full time position. So I, realistically, I, I kind of started the that part of it um, probably before, I guess I was, it was probably 2017 when I first started thinking about ways that I could do more. And, and initially, it kind of just started off as a way of keeping myself accountable as far as continuing to learn. You know, it's, it's very easy when you get a job as a you know, pharmacist, you can make great money in retail, and it's very easy to you know, get a cushy paycheck and start watching Netflix instead of reading, uh, you know, Medscape. And so <laughs> I, I kind of just used that as a tool of, you know, I was trying, I like to teach, even though I, you know, I wasn't in a position to teach at the time. And I like to teach. So I was like, well, how can I maybe use like social media or something like that as a way of helping, you know, stu- up and coming students as well as kind of for it would force me to kind of keep accountable and keep learning and keep staying current with the you know, the newest evidence-based medicine trends and things like that. And so that's kind of where all my side stuff started was that mentality. I had no intentions of it. I never even thought like six people would actually follow my stuff on social media and anything like that. It started off really as a a personal thing just to kind of, I knew that if I started it, then I would keep going because I would be, I would refuse to stop at that point because I didn't want to be like one of those people that start something for a month and then quit. And so it was more just that. It was more just an accountability thing. And then it just turned into a lot more as it went on. But uh, initially, it was more so, yeah, just something supposed to be very simple and just kind of almost for me. So it was, it was interesting how it kind of transformed from there. And so what you're talking about, the, the things that you've done on social media, keeping yourself accountable for, for the clinical information, that eventually developed into you creating a podcast called Core Console RX. Yes. So talk a little bit about that and how that got started. So um, initially it was just Core Console RX was um, just going to be like on social media for like posts and things like that. So, you know, Instagram is the one that I use mainly um, Facebook, some Twitter, some as well, but Instagram was kind of like my main focus. And initially it was just that it was, it was going to be, you know, just posts with like little clinical pearls or, updates and things like that. Um, I was also doing a little bit of like, like landmark clinical trial video reviews and things like that, uh, that I would put on YouTube. But my main focus was just posts on Instagram. And then, you know, the, the more I kind of got established with that, I wanted to try other avenues and audio is kind of the other piece of the puzzle, you know, visual aids with social media video from YouTube. And then I wanted the audio piece. And so I kind of started um, initially, I was doing just uh, like what they call flash briefings on Amazon's Alexa, 
And so I learned how to like get a flash briefing going back then. Like basically Amazon was like, if you don't know how to code, then forget you. Um, now it's become like super easy. You can just drag and click and it's, you're done. Um, but back then it literally was like me and my brother who's at Clemson at the time, like looking through books on how to like write an RSS code, um, that would be able to be uploaded to, uh, Amazon. And then from there I got into the audio stuff and then I wanted to go like full scale podcast and kind of worked my way through that. And that just kind of kept going and snowballed. And, um, now it's to the point where, uh, we just hit, uh, so we've, we've had the podcast now for two years. And I think we've, we've hit 300, a little over 350,000, um, unique downloads and we're on all major platforms. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, pretty, pretty awesome now and something that I, I absolutely love doing, but started off is kind of just a, let's see if this can be something that kind of accent what we were doing on Instagram. And, um, the podcast is now probably the main other than I mean, Instagram still a big, uh, portal that we have a lot of followers and things on, but, um, the podcast is kind of really where a lot of our um, listeners are and stuff. Um, I brought in one of my old students, um, his name's Cole Swanson. He's the co-host on the podcast. He was, he had finished up. He was on rotation with me initially, um, and helped me with some of the stuff when it was early on. Um, he was one of the hardest workers I'd ever had on rotation. And so I asked him when he was getting closer to graduation, if he'd be interested and, uh, he jumped on board and, We've been going after it ever since. Well, I, I think it's awesome. And clearly people are, are are really into what you're doing and the podcast. Otherwise, you wouldn't have over 21,000 followers on Instagram and the number of downloads that you've had. But when, when somebody thinks about getting to that point or even just maintaining and keeping episodes going, I mean, what, was that difficult to do to, to keep it going, keeping things fresh, always coming up with new content? So I think as far as keeping it going, uh, you know, the good thing about medicine is you can never get to the the bottom of it. I mean, we've, that's one of the things we've actually joked about on the podcast is, well, I mean, heck, we can just, we'll just start back over episode one and go through the topics again if we want to. And it'll, it'll basically be fresh because all the stuff, the guidelines will change and new meds will come out and you never really run out of topics because ours was very broad. I mean, ours was pharmacotherapy, like as a whole, evidence-based medicine. We didn't want to like, you know, get only on one topic or one set specific area. So we have a super broad range of topics that we go over. So that makes it easy. And as far as like kind of staying with it, you know, when we were first starting, I, I just always kept everything in perspective as far as, you know, follow. Like I never really cared much about like how many people were following. Like, now that I look at the number of followers and things on Instagram, like it, it blows my mind that six people listen to what I have to say. And so I literally just kept that in perspective. Like we, I remember being like so crazy excited when we hit like a hundred downloads on one episode and be like, cool, check this out. A hundred people download our podcast. That is ridiculous. Who are these crazy people? Why would you want to listen to us talk about anything? I mean, it blew my mind. And so I always had that. I was always so appreciative of anybody that would take five seconds to glance at our stuff that, you know, I never even really thought about the fact that, you know, when we had 500 followers on Instagram, I was like, oh, this is crazy, 500 people. And then it just built and built and built. And so it never really got to the point where I felt like, oh, come on, when is this going to happen? When are we going to finally get to 10,000 or, you know, whatever? Just because I was just enjoying the fact that these people were, I mean, you think about 100 people. Yeah, what that would actually look like if you put them in a room and then people complain that they don't have enough followers. I'm like, 100 people have to care what you have to say. Like, that's huge. And so 21,000 is like unfathomable if I, if I were to actually like line those people <laughs> up. And so, you know, I've just always tried to keep it in perspective and I'm super thankful that anybody listens to my podcast. And so it, that's always been a driving factor as far as I don't want to let them down either and make sure that the information's good and something that's entertaining and what they want to listen to and helpful and, and all that. So it's, it's actually been fairly easy to kind of keep the momentum going just because it's grown. And yeah, just, uh, looking back, it's been like, I mean, the absolute best ride ever. <laughs> is there, is there anything you guys do to, to make it more entertaining? Cause obviously, you know, a lot of, that not everyone enjoys diving into, randomized clinical trials for hours upon hours is there is there how do you guys keep it so obviously you're you're delivering the content but you always keep it entertaining 
and people keep people engaged? So look, when I first was thinking about doing the podcast, my idea for it was I want like high level nerd stuff, but then I also want it to be like super laid back coffee shop type tone. And so I, we, we literally just talk as if we were going to sit it down at Starbucks and then go over some stuff like we're, you know, just, Hey, did you hear about this trial at blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we, we joke. I don't, I don't act any differently on my podcast than I do in real life, um, which I, I joke around a lot. <laughs> I, I'm uh, always cutting up and stuff at work. I mean, you know, I, I grew up surfing and things like that. I mean, I, before I was a pharmacist, I was a professional MMA fighter. I mean, I've had a very different non-medical background in my past. So, you know, now it's like, I don't, I say dude and I, you know, use a lot of slang. And so I just didn't change any of that. I literally just <laughs> brought that into my podcast and I was like, yeah, this is how I talk. I'm not going to change it or try to, you know, make it sound like it's like, I'm something I'm not, this is what you hear is what you get. And, um, but we just tried to make sure that the content was there, but there was just not in the typical, like dry format that usually that kind of stuff is, you know, presented in. There's always like this, it's like you have to like have a certain tone when you talk about clinical medicine. It's like, why though? Who says, who made that stupid rule? And so we just, we just kind of did our own thing. And it's apparently, I mean, there's definitely people who, you know, say that I've gotten emails. It's like, Hey, your stuff's great, but it's a little distracting when you guys will go off on tangents. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but that that's how my brain works. I'm, <laughs> I don't know how to fix that. Like if I could, I'd probably be a lot more successful, but um, you know, I, we just keep it as, honest as we can and you know if and i'm basically if you don't like it there's so many other good podcasts that are a more like lecture style that uh you know they can definitely check those out too so we just kind of we're trying to be authentic with it and let it go from there so obviously having a platform like yours where you have a lot of followers a lot of people download the podcast that opens up opportunities to start monetizing that platform not that that was the intention or is the intention, but obviously those opportunities come about. So how has the the podcast and the and the followership allowed you to to monetize that platform? Or has it, if if not, has it led to opportunities to be monetized? So initially, you know, my main focus for the podcast was to open up more professional doors for, for Cole and I. And so it wasn't so much that I was ever trying to like monetize the podcast itself. And not that I was opposed to that, but I just kind of wanted that to be the attention grabber, if you will, and get people to kind of know who I was because of that kind of stuff and the free content that I was putting out. And then hopefully that would lead to more opportunities. And because of the podcast and because of, you know, my, you know, certain things that I've done clinically and whatnot. Um, I've, I basically was um, offered a, a, a chance to interview for a position of a new PA school that uh, was, was being started in Charleston and was going to basically be the first one besides MUSC that had been done ever in, in this area. And they were a new program. They said, Hey, we wanted to bring a PharmD in to teach pharmacology. And they wanted somebody that was looking to, you know, really like kind of build the program from scratch because they didn't have uh, a curriculum or anything. They had like a skeleton of what they needed to cover topic wise, but they had no, not, not even a single PowerPoint slide made. And so they wanted uh, someone to kind of want, that wanted to build the curriculum as well as, as they put it, they wanted something, somebody was looking for more like innovative ways of teaching. And so I really kind of went to the interview as just sort of like an experience thing. I didn't think there was any chance that I was ever going to actually get to teach. Um, and on paper at the time, I had no business teaching, to be totally honest. I mean, I was 20 years old. I didn't need to be teaching grad school. And uh, I mean, during the interview, I just kind of told them what I had been working on and stuff I had done with like Amazon and uh, the Amazon's Alexa and the different podcasts and the stuff on social media. And they said they liked it and they wanted to give me a chance and brought me onto the program. And so that was the first time where I really had like a a, a big jump in my pay, if you will, um, just from something that had been kind of directly from the stuff I've been doing with Core Console. And since then, I've had speaking uh, opportunities that have paid well, and I've gotten other different things, and, and I've gotten uh, opportunities to help, you know, teach things here and there, other um, schools and whatnot. And it's it's given me a lot of other opportunities that I know will 
in the next probably six months to a year will lead to even more opportunities and things like that. And now I'm not to get too ahead of myself, but I see the path now that it's opening up and all these different doors that it's opening up. And so that's really what I've been focused on now is kind of using it as a, that funnel, if you will, to open up doors that I can then jump through and keep it interesting for me from a career standpoint, as well as find ways to supplement income and, and things like that. And so how often are you teaching at the physician assistant program? So I teach um, an hour and a half lecture twice a week, and I do that almost year round. I, I have like uh, December and January pretty much off. I do like a couple like uh, review classes for the students that are going on to clinicals. Um, but I don't have like regular set lecture times during those two months. But other than that, like I just teach year round. And what kind of income does that bring in? that's extra beyond what you're making in your full-time position? Uh, it ends up being um, with, with others like speaking things kind of thrown in there and other opportunities, like all in all, it probably ends up being around um, 1500 or so a month extra. That's a, that's a nice boost in pay, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a nice little, little, little thing of change. And so when you look at that additional income beyond what you're making in your full-time position, how do you, how do you funnel that extra income? What do you, how do you figure out what you're going to do with that every month? Um, I don't have like a set thing. I mean, some of it I reinvest back into core consult and I mean, realistically, I mean, I feel very, very comfortable where I am now. I mean, my wife's a pharmacist too. She also um, works. She's a, she's a pharmacy manager for Walgreens and she works part-time with her uh, cousin's opioid treatment center and, and does a clinical work for them. So we're like, we feel very comfortable financially. And so anything that we make at this point is, you know, something I try to reinvest back into, you know, other future things, whether that's savings or um, reinvesting back into core consult. And, you know, it gives me a little bit more justification when I tell her I'm going to buy something for the studio for the house. That, you know, <laughs> in our house, she let me build a studio. So she deserves like an award or something for that because it's pretty awesome. We'll have to we'll have to add some photos of that in the sh- in the show notes. There you go. But uh, yeah, so it's it's one of those things that uh, I just kind of try to. I don't have anything set each month um, that I do with it or anything, but uh, we just kind of use it to you know further things along, if you will. So you mentioned that the beyond besides the teaching position that through your platform through Core Consult, you've been able to get other speaking gigs kind of even in addition to that. So what, what do those look like and, and um, what would those typically bring in? Um, it depends. I mean, so some of them will be usually if I'm speaking at an event, it's usually on a certain topic. Like um, I'm speaking in August on uh, dyslipidemia, um, doing like an hour talk on that. Um, doing uh, I did one in Hilton Head, South Carolina, not too long ago. Um, that was, on, uh, I think I was diabetes. I did there. Um, I've done, I did one on like just how different, different ways of like staying current with information and different techniques to kind of, um, keep up to date with everything I've done. I spoke at the Kennedy center on, um, innovation in your field and things like that. Um, so just different topics, but I mean, it can range from, you know, anywhere from a couple hundred bucks to almost a thousand bucks to speak at something. It just kind of depends. On, on the event. I mean, there's some events that like I'll still absolutely do for free. I mean, I'm not opposed to that at, at all. I don't think I'm some fancy speaker or anything like that by any stretch of the imagination. So the fact that people want to hear me speak, I'm like, sweet, I'll be there. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it just depends on the event, but um, it can be a range of that. So obviously we keep talking about core consult, your platform, the thousands and thousands of followers you have on Instagram. It's not something that just happens overnight. So one of my burning questions I have is, is, is how much time are you spending on all these activities beyond your full-time position? I mean, what does that look like? So when, when I first started, that like literally 2017 is kind of when I decided to do this. I, I had like a talk with my wife and was like, look, if I'm going to do this, because she's always been super supportive of me and, and she knows, you know, I get a little crazy with my, with my projects that I want to go on. And, um, so she was like, I, you know, tell me to go for it and things like that. And I said, look, if I'm going to do this, like I need, cause I wanted to be able to do, you know, posts on Instagram and different like graphic type stuff. So I didn't know how to use any of the software that I would need to, let alone do video editing and audio, but 
like I, as far as like graphic design and stuff, I didn't know how to do that either. So I had to like go through, I went to the university of YouTube for hours on end and learned how to do all these different uh, tutorials and things like that with Adobe, like after effects and premiere pro and all that stuff. And so at the time, I mean, I was basically working like every second that I was awake. I mean, I would, if I was off on a, let's, um, when I was at Walgreens, I had um, more days off during the week because I was working like 14 hour shifts at Walgreens. And so I would do, I would just treat the next day. If I was off, I would just treat that as a shift at Walgreens. And I would work 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. on my stuff. And I would eat some lunch and just keep going back at it. And I would just treat it like that. And and it took a lot of my time. I mean, I spent a long, long time um, kind of learning and building and trying new things and seeing what would work what, and what wouldn't work. Um, Richard Waith from uh, RX Radio, him and I used to uh, talk about our uh, our after hours was was 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. and he would he would text me or I would text him at like 1 a.m. to see if we were still working. <laughs> and uh, that was kind of like the ongoing joke for a couple of years. And um, it's one of those things. It's, it's probably not the healthiest lifestyle, but it was something that I knew I wanted to to do and kind of build this platform and. So it was just something I'd kind of made peace with in my mind and as well as, you know, getting my wife's blessing on it and just went for it. So have you, has that scaled back after you've kind of gotten a lot of the the pieces under your belt and, and got acclimated with all the, the tech involved with kind of running the operations? It definitely has to a degree. Um, it, it depends though. I mean, some like last week, um, not at all. Like last week is a bad example because even my wife was like, I don't think I saw you take a break the entire week. And I was like, I don't even remember last week at all. It was just all blur. And so, I, I mean, it was going, cause I was trying to get these different things out. I was trying to help a couple of my buddies start their podcast. And, um, you know, I was just, I had to get stuff going for my class. And so it was just a ton of stuff. So it depends on the week, but a lot of times, um, I do take, you know, if you're looking at the week as a whole, I take a lot more time off. I'm trying to do more fun stuff. I'm trying to go, we're going on vacation in July and then again in November, um, which was like unheard of for us before. So I'm trying to take more time to kind of have somewhat of a more normal life. It's still <laughs> not, not normal by anybody's normal standards, but it's, uh, it feels like I'm working way less from my point of view. And so I feel, you know, like I'm trying at least to move in that direction, but I'm also having a great time with it. So it's hard for me to like, fully get into cruising mode, if you will. Yeah. And I I think, you know, one of the things that always comes up is people ask the question, well, how do you balance these things? And, you know, there was a book that I read one time by Gary Keller called The One Thing. And basically he, he kind of refutes that idea of being balanced in all parts of your life because it can shift. And if, if you want to be mediocre and everything, then you can balance everything. But sometimes some weeks or some seasons, you really got to get the grind on if you want to be successful with whatever you're doing. Um, and sometimes it can take time to get back. So it sounds like I'm kind of hearing uh, a little bit of that from you um, it, because obviously you you have to hustle in order to get the kind of response to get the uh, followers to get the downloads that you're getting because it's not something that it's going to happen with that with little work. Yeah, and it, when usually when people ask me that, like about my like my work life balance, I'm like it's horrible. Like I know it's horrible. I'm not <laughs> I'm not saying to sit here and like try to give like the cliche answer of like no, I'm very balanced. I'm not at <laughs> all whatsoever balanced. But that that's what works for me personally. That's what I need to do to reach my goals. I'm also have no interest in pushing that life on anybody else. Um, I always tell a story about, I had a student of mine that I was, you know, cause I always talk to my students at the beginning of the rotation. I'm like, Hey, cause a lot of them will say, I want to just follow your exact schedule. I'm like, cool. Do you want to do my clinical schedule or do you want to do like my real schedule? <laughs> if you want to do my real schedule, you're in for a horrible month. And, you know, I always give them that like choice. Cause I don't, I don't ever push my work, my poor work life balance on anybody. And I, I tell, I tell, always tell this stu- uh, story of a student that I had where I was talking to him about, you know, different things. And he said, you know, Honestly, I'm because I'm, I don't mean to sound like a slack or anything. He goes, but I want to be, I want to get my farm D. I want to do well at my job, but I really just want to make enough money to where I can surf whenever I want. And, like I loved him for that. Like that's so authentic to him, and that's that's awesome. Like he's going to do a good job. He was going to make a good income, and he's going to enjoy what he loves doing. So I have no interest in like ever pushing, you know, my 
personal like thought process or my goals on anybody. But when I do have, when I hear somebody that's like, I want to do this, I want to take over the world, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, well, if that's the case, then I better not see you at the beach this Saturday on Instagram. You better be working. <laughs> that's not how you get there. <laughs> like, so it just depends. Like it, I just basically, you know, give my two cents on that person's specific goals. And, you know, I think that's still kind of the way I look at it. So I think balance, there is no right balance for anyone. I mean, it's, there's no blanket statement. I can say, okay, now you're balanced. I think it just depends on the person and what you want to do. And are you happy? And that's, that's all that matters to me. It's like, is that that person, you know, happy with where they're at in life? And if they are not, then okay, let's work and let's buckle down and kind of figure out what we need to do to get to the next stage. If you are happy, that's awesome. Good for you. That's great. You know, I have a buddy of mine who makes a fraction of what I make, but he's on, you know, he's on multiple intramural leagues and he does whatever the heck he wants. He's living his best life. He loves it. I'm, uh, you know, it's great. I love that for him. So I just, it really just depends on the person. Well, I think it's cool. And you mentioned this a couple of times that your wife is really supportive of the work that you're doing. And although it may seem, you know, a little bit hectic to somebody else and depending on the life that they want to live, um, but it seems to work for you guys and, and your wife is on board with, with helping you, you know, reach those goals and get to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. And if she wasn't, then we'd have to obviously have a different conversation. Maybe I wouldn't be able to do what I do. So it all just depends. You know, I mean, it's this is working for us at this point. You know, once, you know, other things, life changes happen, I'm sure we'll we'll adjust and change or maybe slow down or who knows. It just depends. But yeah, it's so far, everything's smooth sailing. So Mike, obviously you're you're doing a lot of great things, but one of the topics that comes up with entrepreneurship is failing or failures. Would you say that you've had any failures along your journey or things that, that really didn't work out the way that you thought they were? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, when I, like I said earlier, just kind of briefly is um, basically when I got into pharmacy school, so I had been doing like, uh, you know, some form of martial arts my entire life, like since I was a little kid. And, you know, when mixed martial arts became a thing, like MMA or, you know, the USC is the big one that everybody knows about. But uh, MMA became like a thing um, where there was like professionals that you could make money at. It. That was like, oh, my gosh, I want to do that so bad. Um, I had been working towards that, you know, from my early, probably, I guess, late teens, early 20s. And then when I was 22, 23, whenever, however old I was, when I got accepted into pharmacy school, literally the same week, I got a contract to fight professional MMA and I was like oh crap so I like had a real like kind of dilemma there of which path I wanted to go and I ended up doing both for a little while I fought professionally for like two years of pharmacy school and my first year of pharmacy school went terribly like I mean I, I was completely 100% focused on MMA I barely went to class barely studied and I ended up actually getting I don't even tell the story very much but I actually ended up you know like getting held back my first year. So my first year was so much fun. I got to do it a second time. And like the school was literally like, why do we let this kid in here? Like they, they were like totally not wanting to be a student there anymore. And I mean, you know, at the time, like people looked at me like I was going to be a terrible, I mean, I was, I was told by some people that I would never become a pharmacist. I didn't belong there, blah, 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 blah. And you know, when I finally got to the crossroads of like, okay, I need to pick a path. that has got the longer you know, life expectancy as far as a career goes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 32 right now. That's like 108 in MMA years. And so, you know, I was like, okay, pharmacy is, you know, kind of where it's at. And then I got focused and I kind of just put all that focus into pharmacy and my competitiveness into pharmacy instead of MMA. And that's when things really turned for me. But the, my whole first two years of, or even really almost my first three years of pharmacy school were like all failure to the point where literally nobody was expecting anything out of me. Like the fact that I'm, you know, we have multiple board certifications and things like that. A lot of that stems from stuff that people had told me I would never be able to do back then. Kind of get me a little, little chip on my shoulder, I guess, from it. And a lot of that came from all the times I had done so poorly in school. I mean, if you saw my GPA from like pharmacy school, you'd be like, oh, geez, they'll let you teach people? That's atrocious. But I mean, it's just, I've redeemed myself since then. And obviously uh, I have learned the material since then, but it, I had a very rough start. Uh, a rough half, if you will, to pharmacy school. And yeah, I think um, I was, I got used to uh, being disappointing my professors and things like that. And so it, it was a long like turnaround period that I had to go through to kind of 
get their respect again and, and things like that. So yeah, that's one example. There's plenty of things I can go into, but yeah, I, I think personally, I think failing is super important. I think it teaches you something. I think as long as you look at it the right way, I think it's motivating for a lot of people. I know for me, one of the best things that ever happened to me was someone telling me that I would never become a pharmacist um, while I was in pharmacy school. Um, that I still think about. I'll go on a run nowadays um, where it has nothing to do with pharmacy. I'll just be on a run. I'll be like, I'm so tired. I think I'm going to stop. And I'll think about that person telling me that and I'll start running fast. My <laughs> I mean, it's, it still motivates me to this day. And since then, I have a great relationship with that person. So I don't even, you know, it's not like I have any ill will towards them or anything. But it's just uh, something that I really, really motivated me and gave me a little bit of that competitiveness that I needed, I guess. So I, I think failure is super important. You know, uh, there's people that disagree with me on that and don't think adversity leads to success. But I, I definitely do. I think it's all just the way you look at things and process the, you know, what's put in front of you. I mean, I totally agree. I mean, I think for for me, I look at my own career and my my path with pharmacy, with entrepreneurship, and and failing has has been has really been key. And I look at people who who that are role models or that I look up to that are more successful in things uh, than I am. And I look at you know they they typically what the response that what I've come up with is they either have better habits than I do or they failed more than I have to get to the point and. Of, of where they are. So, you know, I think it's something that that's really critical. Uh, what would you, what would you say to people who, uh, l- let's talk about pharmacists or pharmacy students specifically that are interested in pursuing a business, a side hustle, something like that, but that fear of failure is just paralyzing them. What, what advice would you give to them? Probably just one, figuring out what your side hustle actually needs to be. There's some people that want to do a side hustle that has to do with pharmacy because they happen to be a pharmacist, but they don't like love it. And that I feel like is a very hard thing to to do. I mean, I, I'm, I got very fortunate to where the, my career happens to be the thing that I love and I'm super interested in, but there's a lot of people that that's not the case. And I, so I think that that, that fear of failure, you know, comes into the fact that they don't want to have to put in all those extra hours to begin with. And so that fear of failure is kind of uh, kind of amplified because if they do fail, they wasted all that time versus if you're doing something that you love anyway, like t- for example, that student that I said that wanted to surf, if his, if his business is around surf lessons or something like that, that, fail- that fear of failure kind of goes down because he's doing what he loves anyway. So if the business side of things doesn't work out, then you know, that's not great. But at the same time, that whole time he was kind of doing that extra stuff was something he'd be doing anyway. I think that kind of de-escalates the the fear a little bit. And then ultimately, I think that you need to really kind of figure out who your whose opinion I guess you're worried about you know, if you do fail. You know, what are you worried about like somebody thinking you're a failure? Like who cares what that person thinks? You know, I mean, even if it's somebody close to you, I mean, ultimately, who really cares? And and ha- and why do you care so much what they think? I think that's something that a lot of people have to kind of battle with is, you know, they don't want to put something on Instagram or social media or a podcast because they're afraid that someone's going to think that they're not qualified or they're not, you know, whatever. And I'm, I just, I, I don't know. I just think you just need to really kind of figure out what's going on internally in your own head to where that bothers you, that that person's opinion would keep you from doing what you want to do. Um, I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with. And the sooner you can kind of get past that and, where that is a you know badge of honor kind of thing and be like look if you don't you know there's plenty of people, I have people that I looked up to that told me that core console wasn't a good idea and that literally like made me happy because I was like oh man I cannot wait to prove you wrong this is gonna be amazing and so that's you know that's kind of my personality from the get go but if if that's not your personality I think it's important to kind of you know look at it in that sense of like okay they don't think this is a good idea you know they're gonna laugh at me if I fail okay, this is an opportunity to prove them wrong. And if if they're right and you do fail, okay, then you guys will have some money funny to talk about later and you guys can just kind of poke point yourself. I and mean, there's plenty of things that I've done with Core Console that haven't worked out. So, you know, I just, I think everyone takes themselves so seriously and they're worried about wasting time and things like that. I mean, on paper, Netflix, watching Netflix is a waste of time too. And yet <laughs> the majority of people do that. So it just depends, you know, on the person. But I think, 
coming down to what you really want to do, is that really what's going to make you happy? Are you just doing a side hustle because you think you're supposed to? And then ultimately caring about other people's opinions um, on what you're doing. I mean, are any of them doing side hustles or working extra or putting in extra work? Are they all doing nonsense stuff too? It, It just, other people's opinions, I think is something that so many people struggle with. And I wish that they could kind of be eliminated from the equation, but it takes practice. Definitely. And you reminded me of a quote, uh, l- one of the great motivational speakers, Les Brown. He, he, I don't know if it was from him or, or somebody that he, he was um, mentored by, but he would say that, that somebody else's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And I think you, you've demonstrated that on multiple accounts um, based on your story and, and the things that you've gone through, um, which I think is just amazing when, when you look at that and you look at how people, what their perception was and what they thought of you, but where you are now. I mean, it's just amazing. So what any other books or resources for pharmacists, pharmacy students who want to get into entrepreneurship, pursuing a side hustle? Ooh, so I got to be careful how I word this because <laughs> I don't want to like, I, I, I'm always careful with how I say this because again, this kind of stems from my personality. I'm like very like anti books about entrepreneurship. I think if you have an idea, you need to just try and figure out how you can make that work. And I, I'm a much more of a kinetic learner. Like it would do me no good to like read through a book on how to be an entrepreneurship. One, I don't think you can truly like teach entrepreneurship. I think you can teach like entrepreneurial like tendencies, if you will, but not like true entrepreneurship. And I think that's something that some people just have and some people just have no desire to, to go that route. And I think that if, um, you know, if you have an idea or you want to try something, like try it. Because the other thing is, is like, well, what if somebody's never written a book about the thing you want to do or the idea that you had or no one's ever like, that doesn't mean that it's not a good idea or it's not innovative or not going to work or anything like that. And I think that so many people get caught up on trying to prep for their big like starting moment that it, they get sometimes get caught up in that. Um, I and this is just, again, this is 100% me personally. And there's plenty of people who are way more successful than me that would disagree with this. So I take it, you know, as, as it is. I've personally read like zero books on entrepreneurship. I couldn't tell you, like, when, when you said Les Brown, I like, I have no idea who that is, to be honest with you. <laughs> like, I, I read zero stuff about that. I just, I try things that I think feel right to me and I see what happens. I roll it down, like, all right, let's roll these dice and see if this works out. And if it doesn't work out, cool. If, if it does, then great. I'll take that data and I'll apply it to this next thing I'm going to try. And I just kind of go that way. And I know that doesn't work for everybody. Um, and, you know, if books and things like that is how you learn. And that, that's great. I just, me personally, it's hard for me to kind of give advice on that because I don't, I don't really use that tactic. Um, I just, it doesn't come naturally to me to do that. In fact, usually when I'm reading a book about somebody who's telling me I got to do it this way, this way, my brain defaults into, I'm going to try it the opposite just to see what happens. And it's, it's probably a flaw. I mean, it probably would be way easier if I would just go with the, go with the, uh, the grain on that one. But I just, I can't help it. That's just the way my brain works. And when and it's just very hard for me to see someone who, like I see the life coaches and things like that. I'm like, eh, I mean, Cool. I, I hope, I wish you all the best, but I just have a hard time getting behind a lot of that stuff. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think you, you said it, I mean, y- you may operate a, in a much different wavelength than somebody else and be willing to take more failures and hits versus trying to prep for any, everything that you're going to do versus just putting it out there and start. But I think a lot of people that they're so afraid of getting started or so afraid of putting themselves out there that, that they never get their idea. They never get their business off the ground just because of that. So I think you, I think you shared some really, really key points there. Well, Mike really appreciate you coming on the podcast, sharing your story, uh, sharing your tips uh, for pharmacists, for pharmacy students who have an interest in starting a side hustle, becoming an entrepreneur what is the best way for someone to reach out to learn more about you and, and what you're doing with core consult? Um, so you can, you can, uh, you know, email me directly if you want. It's just M Corvino at core consult RX and core consult is C O R like my last name, Corvino consult all one word. It's like the worst branding of all time. Um, so core consult RX.com is my email. Um, you can go to the website um, you can follow me on like any social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, you know, any of those things, even LinkedIn. 
um, Twitter, all that good stuff, all the same handle, Core Consult RX. Um, you can reach out to me uh, via text if you want. Um, I have a texting platform that you can contact me directly. Um, it's area code 415 943 6116. Um, I do like answer like pharmacotherapy questions and stuff over text in real time. So that's been kind of fun. Um, but yeah, any of those things you can get in touch with me. I'm, I'm fairly easy to contact um, depending on which medium you want to use. Wow. Are you as fired up as I am? As Mike was telling his story, I honestly felt like I was watching the movie Rocky and Gonna Fly Now kept coming on. Has anyone ever told you that you weren't good enough for something? You didn't have the training or credentials to get a particular job? Or your business idea or plan wasn't going to work? I've certainly heard things like that before. Sometimes that can be the ultimate motivation to do or stick with something. But beyond that, I think Mike illustrated that building a brand or platform can take a ton of time and effort, not just hours but even years to gain a huge following and begin to start monetizing and unlocking these opportunities. While that may seem overwhelming and intimidating, just remember as Zig Ziglar said, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. 